is just, uh, especially these first couple, but really most of the time, is about um, helping you understand and work through and think about the, the methods. Um, I had everybody fill out these um, uh, this uh, zero point um, uh, quiz that I think everybody did about what each method does. Um, and, uh, and so, um, in, in kind of thinking about um, um, the best way to structure today, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the paper that I sent out. Um, I think everybody got a chance to at least read the abstract. It sounded like it got dense beyond that, which they do. Um, and that's, uh, and um, the, the goal is that by the end of the semester, um, you'll be able to pick up something like this and, and understand what they're doing um, and also think about uh, I mean, these are sort of like, in a sense, ancient scaled down versions of the kinds of things that, that a lot of you will be doing. Um, so, uh, so, you know, this is 15 years old. Um, uh, you may have noticed that I was one of the authors, which is how I chose it, because um, I knew the paper a little bit. Um, but, uh, you know, it's 15 years old, looking at one protein phosphorylation of one, one little thing. Um, but a lot of the automated bio research that you're going to be learning about in um, uh, next semester when you take whatever they, I forget what they, what uh, Dr. Langmead calls this class, it used to be called automation and biological research and now it's something else, um, is essentially um, doing this sort of thing, but like for a hundred proteins at once, like all in parallel with some mechanized system, um, which is great, um, but if you don't understand how it works with one protein, then uh, then you're going to be completely lost sort of having a deep critical understanding. Um, and again, like I said before, we don't want you to be like thinking of this is just like, a, okay, this is, um, uh, you know, I, I, I just take the data in and I compute with it. But we want you to think about and understand where the data comes from, what it all means. Um, the list of, uh, I guess I, I, I uh, uh, um, can put, uh, well, the list of things that I had we're roughly divided into um, proteins and DNA um, related, uh, um, uh, related techniques. Um, this paper is mostly a protein related uh, paper. Um, of course, as we talked about a little bit in class yesterday, DNA and protein have this intimate relationship where DNA codes for proteins. Um, but um, uh, what, I, what I think we're gonna do is, is talk about the protein stuff which were the first four or five items um, today, um, partially in the context of this paper and partially just sort of in general, um, and then, uh, and then um, talk about the DNA stuff uh, in the second part. So, um, the first thing to do, actually I lied before, um, I said not to get in groups, but let's go ahead and see, I, I, I don't have a good count of who's in which group, but let's see what happens if we do group one, group two, Group three and group four over there, um, so that you can all uh, get, to, get to know more. Um, I know that, like I guess this is optional, so not everybody's here, but let's reorganize like that and see if we have roughly equal numbers in all four groups. So, um, four, six, um, so for the next six minutes or so, um, uh, discuss and and um, and, and um, what are what's similar about DNA gel electrophoresis um, and as in SDS polyacrylic. Um, uh, I should say I, um, uh, SDS is a is a detergent, um, and then this stands for poly. Um, gel electrophoresis. You can use um, you can use polyacrylamide gels for DNA. Um, 
but uh, DNA is normally done with another type of gel, which is agarose, which is a seaweed protein, kind of like jello. Good, it looks like we've got nice even numbers. So what's similar, what's different about these, just like two minutes, um, sort of talk to each other and think about what, what's similar and what's different between them. Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll come back and sort of talk uh, as a group about it. Or, Yeah, we're not to the paper yet. We're just general general methods from the quiz. Hey. Uh, okay, so um, it's I, I think think people have gotten some progress along thinking about this. Um, the basic idea here. What, what, what's the basic idea? Why, why would you want to do electrophoresis? What, what is it going to help you to figure out? To separate and analyze the the, the, the DNA. Yeah. So let's say, let's start with let's say for DNA, for example. Um, Right, so, so we're going to separate DNA. How, how is it separating the DNA? Different molecular sizes, right. So we end up, um, actually, there are, uh, well, yeah, whatever. It's, you end up with this like, sort of um, uh, slab of jello with little holes carved into it um, that we call, um, we call those a well, um, like, a, like a well you dig in the ground. And then you put a sample that contains DNA in, and you have an electric field across this. Um, which way is the DNA going to go? Well, it's going to go down, right. But how do I make it go down? I need to put the, uh, Yes, right. Um, so let me see how well this works when I try and show things with the board still there. Um, so not well at all. So we'll, 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 we'll put the screen out in a second. But this is DNA. 
Uh, we'll get to know it a lot more um, uh, next week, and then we'll be talking about DNA methods a lot more. But every single um, link along the DNA chain has a negative charge phosphate. So we have this uniform negative charge across the DNA. Um, and so, and then this gel matrix. And so it's sort of like um, the, the thing I imagine is like, um, you know, a person trying to run through a forest. If you have um, a, a stick this long and you're trying to run through a forest, then every once in a while you kind of have to dodge the trees. If your stick is like five meters long, then you're going to have a lot more trouble and slow down. If you've got a 50 meter long stick, it's going to be really hard for you to bottom leap between those trees. So we have a positive charge here, negative charge here. The DNA is repelled by the negative charge, attracted to the positive charge. But the longer the, the strings of DNA, or RNA, or whatever, there are, the slower it's going to go through this, um, this gel matrix set. Um, does that kind of make sense for that? Um, OK, so um, then with, uh, let's see, let's, so let me put the screen down here so we can actually see what I'm showing. Um, all right, and then so quick pop quiz, which one of these is an agarose gel and which one's an SDS page, SDS gel? Does anyone have any ideas? Um, seen this? You think, oh yeah, the one of the, so, so unless you've worked with these before, you probably don't know, but the way that it ends up getting set up is that the slab of agarose is flat and the electric current runs sideways through it. The SDS gels actually run vertically, but the same idea is here with a positive charge down there and negative charge up there. Um, yeah, so, so, um, and, and so with proteins, there's this complication that we have to deal with. And this is something that we're going to return to a little bit um, next class period. But with proteins, the complication is um, here, um, is that proteins are made up of amino acids. Unlike DNA, where there's a single negative charge for every base, every letter of DNA, proteins, every individual monomer that makes it up, a lot of them are electrically neutral. Some of them are um, uh, um, going to be positively charged. Some of them are going to be negatively charged. Some of them have some polarity in their bonds, but no net charge. And so as a result, um, proteins have this extra layer of complexity to them where it's not just how big they are that determines how fast they go through, but also what else is going to play and come into play with how, how, how far a protein is going to go through the gel. The charge, right? If, if the protein has a whole bunch of negative charges on it, then it will, just like our DNA, run, excuse me, run toward the positive electrode. But if we happen to have a protein with a bunch of negative charges on it, it's actually going to go flying up out the top of our gel or the wrong way, um, running toward our negative electrode. Um, and so that's where, that's why we use SDS for a lot of, um, for a lot of, Gels. Um, so, um, so does anyone know what SDS does? A couple people mentioned this in there. To in there. break down the tertiary. Yeah, actually, that's what. Actually, that was a trick question because there are multiple things SDS does, and that's one of them. So, um, one thing that is that proteins are not just um, we uh, are not just strings of amino acids the way that DNA is strings of bases. But proteins fold up into this complicated uh, into this complicated structure. Um, one thing SDS does is it simplifies the problem by straightening it out, so we don't have to deal with like if it's a tight glob, it might be able to find a quicker way through than if it's a long string. So that's one thing that SDS does. Um, it provides the negative charge. Right. The other thing that it does is it covers the protein with negative charges everywhere. So now we've simplified the problem, so it's kind of like DNA again. Um, again, DNA has naturally is just co uh, is just covered in negative charges. Did I get, did I get rid of my DNA? Maybe um, uh, DNA is just is just naturally covered. Oh, here it is. Um, DNA is just naturally covered in negative charges, one um, per um, uh, per base. Um, the SDS kind of coats 
the proteins so that it's negative, so that they're negatively charged, and they can go. Um, and, and so then again, we now are separating proteins by um, molecular weight, by their size. Does that make sense? What, okay, so yeah, what questions do people have? I, again, I talk quickly. What questions do people have about all of that? Right, uh, yes, um, so uh, this gets into stuff that we haven't really quite gotten into in the class yet, but um, the tertiary structure is caused by a few things. One thing that causes the tertiary structure is that proteins generally are floating around inside a watery cell, yeah. um, and so the charged amino acids and also the amino acids that don't carry a charge but have um, um, polarity to them tend to be on the surface because water is very polar. We'll get into that a little bit next time. Um, uh, and then also, uh, and, and then the other ones get tucked in, in the middle. And then also there are these things called hydrogen bonds where, pro where, where amino acids from one part of the protein might stick to an amino acid from another part of the protein. Uh, so linearly they're very far apart, but they fold back together and stick to each other. Um, and that breaks that down as well. Um, there are even some other bonds. Uh, sometimes you put in, um, uh, sometimes um, cysteine residues can actually form um, a, a stronger chemical bond across long distances on the protein. So sometimes you put that in to break that further down. Um, but yeah, so, so you sort of, it's called denaturing. They talk, did you talk about boiling an egg yesterday in yeah. class? Yeah, so it's, that's, that's basically what the SES does, is it just sort of boils the egg. It, 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 it breaks all the protein bonds. So. Yeah. Um, so that you've got now this nice, um, uh, sort of this uniform set of just strings of protein. Why do you just simply boil the protein? Ah, well, actually, you do usually boil them in the SDS, but one of the reasons is you don't want them to, so um, without, it, I've never done this experiment. I wonder if you, if you boiled an egg that was mixed up with detergent, whether it would turn white or not. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but you boil it with detergent so that once it cools down, it doesn't clump up into a globby mess, um, but instead the individual molecules stay separated from one another because they're all coated with negative charge and so they're sort of repelling one another. If they bump into each other, they're not gonna stick. Whereas the boiled egg, the, the albumin protein breaks apart, but then it gets twisted all together with itself. And we want to avoid them getting twisted back together. And so the detergent keeps that from happening. Yeah, good, good question. Do you, there's another question about Um, yeah, it's actually, it's by weight, um, and I don't remember why it ends up, because size is much more intuitive to me, and I always think of it by size. Steph, do you happen to know? Yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so, somebody, somebody who's a better physicist than me, it has to do with um, the inertia and the drag and the, for, and, and the force and charge, but I, I think part of the issue is that the amino acids, um, it gets like one SDS molecule for every three amino acids, but then there's inertia based on mass rather than length, which is a key factor um, that, that, that separates by size more than length. Yeah. But th that's, that's a poor recollection at best. So I'm not, I think that's my best guess, but I'm not 100% sure. I do know it separates by weight. I don't remember why it is weight and not length. Yeah. Yeah, great question. Agarose is a protein, um, and so um, it's, a, it's a seaweed protein. Um, Jello is also a protein. It's actually like a ground of horse protein or something, but, um, uh, but um, proteins make a nice gel matrix, and they're cheap and easy to produce. Um, acrylamide is, uh, is a little bit more expensive, also potentially toxic, um, and so we don't use it as much, um, but, uh, but running a bunch of proteins through a matrix of proteins is just sort of asking for a giant mess. And so we'd rather run it through a, a matrix of essentially uh, jelly plastic, which is what polyacrylamide gel is. Yeah. 
Um, and DNA, you can also run DNA through acrylamide gels. You actually get a little bit better resolution, but it's more expensive. So a lot of times people just do um, um, uh, the, the agarose gels for that. Um, okay, so um, yeah, one other thing. So in terms of um, so, something that we're not going to talk about immediately, but something that you may come across, and, and we will get into, there are various other things that people do to separate proteins based on their natural charge. So sometimes you're interested in what the natural charge of proteins are. Um, another thing that you might be interested in is do proteins normally come in pairs? Sometimes um, for hemoglobin, for example, um, always comes four subunits stuck together. If you put SDS in the hemoglobin, those four subunits come apart into four individual spaghetti strands, which can be interesting if you want to see the components but if you want to see the whole structure, then you might want to leave that together. Um, and so that's called native gel electrophoresis. And this is an example that I just grabbed off of the internet um, of uh, some samples run under native conditions. The proteins are negatively charged on average, so they still go down. Um, and then samples run under SDS page. Um, uh, and so there are some uh, sort of uh, uh, differences um, in in where the proteins run. Some of them have more negative charges, so they run faster for the molecular weight um, uh, than, than, uh, than when they're under the, um, the um, denatured condition. Uh, and so this is a way that you might, you can look at a protein under multiple dimensions. There are other ways to separate by charge, something called two-dimensional gel electrophoresis that we'll come across a little bit later on. But sort of the first couple are just to give you like, like sort of the, the, the very basic traditional methods that are the foundation of a lot of biology research. Um, so yeah, so that's, um, uh, yeah, you know, native means not denatured, not broken apart. SDS is is when you've sort of separated them into individual strings that you're that you're going to, to look at. Um, like I said before, we'll talk about. Uh, actually, I think I'll say this. Um, we'll talk about DNA more next time and PCR and so on because before we really get into that, we're going to need to um, uh, we're going to really need to um, have a um, have a have a good solid understanding of, of DNA replication. Um, and for today, we kind of just want to talk about probing for proteins. Um, yeah, okay, so questions about that. As you're coming in, go ahead and find your group. We have one, group one, group two, group three, group four. Just, yeah. Okay, so um, the next... Uh, Oh, yes, what's up? Uh, sorry, I don't understand what, what the LG and LA means. Oh, yeah, this was like, um, uh, I think this is milk proteins, and it's like, um, uh, uh, I don't even remember what it was, um, like lactose, uh, lactose generase and lactose amylase, or something, I don't remember. They, they're, they're individual, this is individual proteins that this group was interested in, and um, the point here is not, about the individual proteins, we're going to get to that with the paper. This is just to show you that you can either keep the globs together and run them together, or you can separate them apart and see the individual components. Um, this is in milk. I'm not an expert on milk, so I don't know what all the things are. Yeah, yeah. Why, why do we do algos gel in a flat way and the page on um, I think that agarose is a little fragile, and it kind of would fall apart if you did it vertically. Um, okay. And the polyacrylamide gel also is fragile, but you end up assembling it vertically. Um, so, so, so it just ends up sort of being easier to set up that way, and it works It works either way. So but does it, the gravity help? No. <laughs> gravity, the only way the gravity helps is, is because you're putting a, a large, fragile thing on a long, flat surface. It's gonna. It's not gonna break apart on you because you're sort of putting something on a table instead. Of, instead of standing something up on, on its end and hoping it stays up, you're just putting it flat on the table. I mean, the gravity, gravity helps. The but no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. The gravity doesn't pull the protein down because um, the protein is not significantly denser than the the gel matrix that it's running through. Okay, so. Um, 
All right, so, so if we, you know, this is pretty small. Let's see if it will get bigger for me. No. There we go. If you do an SDS page gel, one thing you can do is just put on a chemical that will make all, that will stick to all proteins and make them blue. Um, and this is an example of something taken from like heart or something like that, where what we're seeing is all of the different, every, every little band is, so, so um, uh, like there's 10 different proteins that, that are running around in these heart cells. Um, or in our in our sample, there's really going to be thousands, but let's say we isolate ten of them. Then each protein has its own distinct mass, and so the ones that are down at the bottom are the smallest. They got the fastest through the gel. The ones that are up high are the biggest and move the slowest. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because they're going to get it's like that guy trying to get through the forest with the big long tree or the little short tree. You go farther. Um, and so here, you can, if you're interested, you can see all of the proteins in your sample. Um, but uh, one of the other questions that we asked about um, was, um, uh, that I asked about was um, something called Western blots. Um, and so with Western blots, um, step one, again, let's see if this gets bigger for us. Step one is to do an SDS page gel right there. Um, actually, step one through five-ish, or one through seven, I guess, is to run this SDS page gel. Um, and then what we're going to do is... Um, Turn the gel on its side so let's, let me go. draw this out. I, w I, I wish this room had more. So this is. Um, we have three samples that we put into our SDS page gel, and then there's a whole bunch of proteins in each sample. I can see all the proteins that I want, but maybe I just really want to know about um, one particular protein. Um, so what I can do is I can take out that gel and lay it flat on essentially a piece of paper. It's a, like a special filter paper. But I essentially lay it flat on a piece of paper so that now I've got my gel sort of So I can sort of, you can sort of imagine turning it like this so that you're looking at the side of it. So there's my gel. That was a front view. This is a side view, right? So it's kind of thin. Um, and then I put right next to it a piece of paper, special filter paper, And then the goal is to get the proteins to get out of the gel and onto the filter paper. Right? That makes sense, sort of. Okay. So let's see. Let's um, take another quick break. Uh, two, three minutes. First of all, double check with everybody in your group. Make sure you understand this image here where we saw in blue all of the proteins and what that meant. And then second, so review SDS page for proteins. Um, and then number two is how are we going to get the 
protein out of the polyacrylamide gel and on to the paper. So think about what are we going to do to get that to happen. Oh yeah, what's up? Question? Yeah. Um, uh, so there, there are many strains here. So is that is it called a, a string? Um, it's yeah. called a band. A band. Yeah. A band. Okay. Is the band thicker and there are more more proteins? Oh, uh, which which band? Yeah, the band is going to be darker. If it, so if you have, if, if um, like in this sample, if these are the same protein, but in this sample there was a lot of it, then it's going to be very dark, and this one's going to be faint. Uh, so has it something to do with the thickness? It's more the um, it's more the darkness. Darkness. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, so there's a little bit of imprecise. So all of it, the bands are all a little bit imprecise. And so if there's um, what's above visual detection threshold will appear wider if there's just more stuff. But that's not because it's just because your visual system has a threshold for what it can detect. And there's a Bell shape, a bell shape distribution for the, for the where the band actually ends up, yeah. and so what's above the threshold for detection is going to be pretty narrow if there's not much, yeah. whereas what's above threshold for detection is going to be broader. So it looks broader, but it's really yeah. just darker. Like, just darker. Like, 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 so, what questions? What questions have, have come up so far? How to transfer? <laughs> How to transfer? Okay. Um, well, I think uh, maybe Seth and I will walk around and check in each group a little bit and see where everyone's. Doing. So, it sounds like there's still a lot of discussion. How's it going? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, it's, 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 it's
Uh, yeah, it's some, I, I can't remember either. It's some, it's some yeah. 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 I mean, for, yeah, I, I sort of simplify it to paper, but, um, but, but um, I mean, if we get on the, like, Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's usually, some of the people use the same offer that you used to write down. Uh, it's um, uh, the, the SCS offer that you used to write down. And actually, there's like a whole bunch of other stuff. There's like uh, there's like sponges and, and more stuff that you put on there. But, 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 but you know, the, 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 the more idea is that you want to um, transfer the protein So there's this there's this giant it ends up being this sort of big apparatus with a whole bunch of layers of stuff. There's like sponges and there's fluid around and everything. But the ultimate idea is just that we've got some proteins in here and we've we've already covered them with negative charge. And we just need to get the proteins, which are sort of as these little bands here in the gel, we just need to get them onto the surface of this paper or like plastic coating stuff. So what, what, how are we going to move elect, uh, electrically negative things out of the gel and onto the surface of this? And the electric field. Yeah. What, what, what charge? Uh, also positive yeah. charge. Yeah. So we just put this big old plate of positive charge here. We have a big metal plate with negative charge here. The protein zips on over. And then, um, and so now where there used to be protein embedded in our gel, now there are bits of protein stuck on the surface of our membrane, and then if we sort of turn this back around so we're looking at the front of it again, we've got now bands of protein that used to be in three columns on our gel, now existing as blobs of proteins that are in bands on this paper that we've, that we're, we've got. So we've gotten it stuff. That's a Western blot. Just getting it out of the gel, Onto some paper. Is that yeah? Um, once you've done that, and they're on paper. Is that resolvable by the naked eye, or do you still need to apply that with the? Um, right. Yeah. The, so the proteins are not visible. There are stains that you can do where you can see every protein. But usually, the reason why you do a western is. Um, is this. Let's see. The reason why you do a Western is this. So you've got a whole bunch of proteins on here, and then what you get is um, you get antibodies. Um, and antibodies are part of the immune system. Your immune system makes them um, as a way to identify very specifically something that does not belong in your body. Um, for us, as researchers, we don't care about the immune system so much. This is just a useful tool. And so what we do is, let's say I'm really interested in finding a protein called um, uh, um, the capsaicin receptor. And I want to find the capsaicin receptor. What I do is I take a little bunny rabbit and inject a whole bunch of capsaicin receptor into its blood, then the little bunny rabbit 
makes antibodies that stick to the capsaicin receptor, then I collect those antibodies from the bunny rabbit, and that's what I call my primary antibody, and now we back up here, there was a ton of protein on this gel, but I only care about the capsaicin receptor, so I, so, and so I just, that bathe, just kind of like wash and, and soak the gel in this antibody, and the antibody is only going to stick to the places where the capsaicin receptor is. Does that make sense? So its job is to stick to proteins. I get a bunny rabbit to make a bunch of antibodies that stick to capsaicin receptors. And now, wherever the capsaicin receptor is on my membrane, on my filter paper, the little bunny rabbit's antibodies are stuck, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? Uh, you have to wash it. Yeah, so I, I'm skipping over a lot of, they're, they're, if you're doing this in a lab, they're, this, each, each one of these things is like a 10 step process, where because you have to, first actually you have to cover the paper with a bunch of other protein that you don't care about from milk or something, unless you were doing milk, but you know, whatever, cover it with a bunch of other protein so that the antibodies don't stick randomly. Then you have to put the antibody on then you have to wash it away so that only the places where it's really stuck, which is where the capsaicin receptor is where, is where it goes. So there's a lot more steps to it, but sort of the, the big picture idea is that there's a bunch of protein on my gel, some of it I care about, I've got an antibody that's gonna to stick to that some of it that I care about. And then there are a bunch of steps you need to do to make sure that you get it precise and so on. Does that? But actually, what I wanna ask is that since the protein is yeah. Um, the protein, so the membrane is designed so that protein sticks to it. And actually one of the reasons you do this, this step where you, co you coat it with milk first is because milk has a lot of protein because antibodies are made of protein. And if you don't cover the rest, cover the membrane with a bunch of protein, then the antibody is just going to stick randomly everywhere. So, um, yeah. So, so the, the protein stays stuck to the membrane. Um, where, where you put it originally. Um, and then the task becomes finding that protein in the sea of everything else, which the antibody helps with. And there's, there's a lot of complexity in how you get it very precise, but to a first approximation, it's just because the antibody sticks really well with them. Yeah. When you said the antibody will stick everywhere, you mean it'll stick all over the membrane? If we don't cover it with other non-interesting non, uh, protein first. So you cover so the rest of the membrane. With, all the yeah. Protein. Right. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it binds to the membrane directly. Um, then what I do is I take, is I get like a goat to make an antibody that binds to rabbit antibodies. Um, and the reason for this um, is, is that um, I can, so, so it's possible to stick on the back side of an antibody um, a fluorescent molecule that glows a certain color or, a, um, or an enzyme that's going to convert something blue into something pink or whatever. Um, but that's expensive, and if there are a hundred or a thousand proteins that I'm interested in, I don't want to make a thousand really expensive antibodies that each has their own little color to it. Instead, what I do is I make a thousand cheap antibodies that have nothing special on them, and then I make a few antibodies, so I make, for example, a goat antibody that sticks to rabbit antibodies. So I've got this sort of like chain of connections going. So the protein I care about, and then I've got a bunny rabbit antibody that sticks to the protein that I care about, and then I've got a goat antibody that sticks anywhere there's bunny rabbit antibodies, and that goat antibody is now the thing I can find and see, because it either has on the back end something that will turn blue if I put a certain chemical on, or it's naturally fluorescent, meaning if I shine one wavelength of light on, it reflects a different wavelength back at me, and so I can therefore detect, or maybe it's radioactive, whatever, doesn't matter, I can detect where my target protein is by seeing where the secondary antibody is. And the second, and, I, and, I, and so, so you, know, you know, wherever the rabbit antibody is, that's where my protein is, that I care about is. And wherever the rabbit antibody, where, and wherever the goat antibody is, that must have sucked to rabbit antibody. That kind of makes sense. It's, it's sort of a cost-saving way of doing things, and that's a, so. Yeah, um, 
But that's how we detect those signals. So logically, our, our target protein can mix and combine with the secondary. Ah, yes. So, um, so antibody, so, so that can happen. There are a variety of controls that you do that we can talk about later to, to sort of minimize that. Like you might do one where you don't put the primary antibody on. You might do the same, you might do a parallel experiment where you do everything else the same minus the primary antibody. Something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, but that's great. That's exactly the sort of thing that you want to worry about. It's like, what are, what are the places where this can break down, right? What if my rabbit antibody sticks to four proteins in my sample instead of one? That's going to be a problem. Then I'm going to think it's four places instead of one. What if my secondary antibody accidentally sticks to two other proteins in my sample? That's going to make me get a, get a false read as well. And so, um, and so you want to, and, and so you design the experiment to 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 see, you know, how, um, um, uh, you know, it, including the second, do it without the primary antibody, see where things stick, and so on. Usually, antibodies do a pretty good job of being pretty specific. But um, yeah, this is something that uh, you know don't doesn't. You, what is important to know that what you're really detecting is the secondary antibody, and you and then because you sort of invisibly these other invisible steps went on, you believe that's where your protein is, but you don't know you or what you all you know is where the secondary antibody is. Yeah, sure. You were saying that um, to save on cost, that you would only design a few secondary antibodies to detect the primary, but you're still trying to resolve hundreds or thousands of Proteins, have you determined which ones are? Yeah, the yeah. Um, so, what, what, uh, I, what we've got are, there, there are like six or so organisms. So, you know, people do it to chickens, rabbits, um, uh, mice, rats, a few other species. And so, those are the species where you make primary antibodies. And one of the features of antibodies is they're variable at this end. So, the, that end sticks to a bunch of different things, but they're constant at this back end. And so every bunny rabbit antibody is going to be the same at this back end. And then I get a goat antibody that sticks to the constant. So any rabbit primary, my goat ant secondary is going to stick to. And then maybe I have a horse secondary, uh, a secondary, a horse generated antibody that sticks to any rat generated primary antibody or something like that. And so, um, and so because the back end is species specific. But is the same for any antibody that, that's made in that species. Um, that that's sort of, yeah. So does that then allow you to classify groups of proteins there instead of individual ones? Because you still, it sounds like you're still limited to one species per identification. Um, yeah. I mean, um, so well, so yes. Um, well, so so I guess in a perfect world. What I would have is a bunny ant and a, a rabbit antibody that only sticks to the protein I care about, and then a goat antibody that only sticks to rabbit antibodies. And then I can find my protein. Um, you can design experiments that sort of leads into this. Um, maybe you're interested in a few different proteins. So there's um, this is a nice illustration of. There's a whole bunch of proteins on your membrane, all these triangles and, and hexagons and whatever, they're all on your membrane. And then there are three proteins on the membrane that you care about. Um, and so you might make a bunny rabbit antibody that binds to protein one, and then a goat antibody that glows red that binds to the bunny rabbit antibody. And then a um, uh, 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 rat antibody that binds to protein number two, and a horse antibody that glows blue that binds to your rat antibodies. And then, um, uh, and then maybe, I don't know why they did red again, maybe this is supposed to be a different shade of red or purple or something. Um, but then uh, maybe, you know, then, then you get a mouse antibody that binds to protein three, and a donkey antibody that glows purple that binds to or infrared or whatever. That binds to that. And so then wherever I see red signal, I know I've got protein one. Wherever I see blue signal, I, 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 can, I infer that I have protein one. Wherever I see red signal, I infer that I have protein two. Wherever I have blue signal, I infer that I have protein three. Wherever I have infrared signal, um, given the other caveats that we've discussed along the way as well. Yeah. Is there another question? Sorry, I, I didn't quite understand why. 
uh, how this uh, how the secondary and the primary and the just just run together? Yeah. So um, so um, the way I make a primary antibody is I um, uh, is I just take, get a bunny rabbit and put a bunch of my protein that I'm interested in into the bunny rabbit, so it makes antibodies or rat or whatever. The secondary antibodies, those are made, um, those are sort of mass produced now, and what we have are um, uh, cell lines that came from some donkey somewhere 30 years ago that are now just growing in a, in a petri dish in a laboratory. Um, and these cell lines, um, for decades, have been engineered to just churn out antibodies that stick to any rabbit antibody and also have a red tag stuck on the back end of them. Um, and so just like the primary antibody can stick to the protein I'm interested in, the secondary antibody can stick to the... the primary antibody you choose. Yeah, the primary antibody I make. Some, for some common proteins now, those are available commercially. Actually, a lot now are available commercially. That, that, when I was, that when I was doing this experiment, we had to make our own antibodies and get our own, well, hire somebody to get a bunny rabbit, whatever for us. Um, but, uh, um, but actually, but, uh, um, but yeah, so, so uh, uh, but again, so the antibody has this sort of Y shape where this end is variable and so binds, we can, we can get it to bind to our protein, the one we care about, and then this end is constant by species. And so, the, so every rabbit antibody is going to have the same back side to it. And then what I do is I make a goat antibody that sticks to the back side of the rabbit antibody. And so then whenever rat, whatever antibodies I get out of my bunny rabbits, the goat antibody is going to stick in radioactive or whatever it is. Does that help? Yeah, so um, let's see. Um, I think that that was most of the stuff in terms of um, background material for this. Um, so Um, where is my, there's my, there's the paper. Oh. Okay. Here we go. All right, so here's the paper that, um, that I sent for you all. Um, so... Actually, before we do the paper, one other digression. Antibodies are fun and useful because you can find proteins. You can figure out where they are based on their molecular weight and confirm their identity with an antibody. That's great. Um, you can also use antibodies in a similar but um, non-identical way. Um, and if you go to any of the research pages for a lot of the faculty members here in biology, here or in any university, they will tile their, their, um, their front pages with images like this. Um, and what this is, is instead of doing antibodies, that one's not, that one's not um, but um, instead of running a gel, what I can do is I can just take some tissue, I can just take a bunch of cells, brain cells, kidney cells, whatever I'm interested in. They could be cells that are dividing, whatever. And I can just um, uh, uh, sort of just call fix them, so sort of like chemically shut them down and freeze their biological processes. Um, and then just like we did with the Western plot, I can start washing some antibodies on. And so if there's a particular protein that I'm interested in, um, in a second one will come up with 
some with some surviving, but um, um, you know, let's say I, I, let's say there's some particular protein in the nucleus that I'm really interested in. I can find, I can generate or nowadays purchase an antibody that binds to that protein that I'm excited about, um, or actin, which is involved in cell division or whatever, uh, or microtube and and and, 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 and then tubulin. So uh, actin's anyway. There's proteins I care about. I get an antibody and wash it onto this sort of these, these dead cells, these cells that I just that I just sort of plasticize and kill. And then just like with the Western blot, wherever that protein is, the antibody sticks. And then I get a secondary antibody. And wherever the secondary antibody is sticks, that's where my protein is. And so then I can and I can get multicolored secondary antibodies. And so, let me see if I can get this to pause on the one that I, uh, so, um, it, here we go. So, for example, um, the red is actin. It's a protein that forms some of the like, surface of the cells, right underneath the membrane that separates the cells. The blue is actually highlighting some of the proteins that are associated with chromosomes. And then the green is microtubules, which is another form of the cell skeleton that's involved in cell division. And so I can generate these kind of cool pictures, but they're actually also showing me something. They're showing me where the protein is in living tissue. Um, because the step that we sort of glossed over with the Western blotting is what you do is you take some cells and like grind them all up and boil them so that the proteins all separate, which is great if you want to know what proteins are in this glob of cells. But if I want to know where the proteins are in the living tissue, then what I need to do is sort of freeze the tissue or sort of chemically, chemically halt the biological processes in the tissue, and then I can use antibodies, just like a Western, to find the proteins there. And it generates these really cool, pretty images that people like to put up on their lab website, but it's also actually telling us where proteins are in, a, in living cells, maybe while they're doing a particular process. These cells are all in the middle of dividing. Um, and so that's another use of antibodies. That's also another use of, this, is, this would be fluorescence microscopy um, as well. Um, is, uh, so here, what I've got is, um, uh, is um, antibodies telling me where proteins are. Um, and so, and then I use a microscope that looks at the fluorescent antibodies that glow different colors when I shine different lights on them. And so I can see proteins that are there. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Yeah, by now the yeah by now the tissues are dead. Um, when that ha at that point. Um, oh, I got rid of it. I thought I had. Let's see if I can pull it back up. Um, uh, so Allison Barth, who who we all saw a talk. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a way to freeze this. Um, so some of these. There, there's one other thing that I can do, um, which is modify a protein and make what's called a fusion protein. And so with a fusion protein, there might be some glob of whatever that I'm interested in, called my protein, whatever I care about. And then I s modify the gene, so instead of stopping when it gets to the end, it just keeps going, and then it makes a whole other glob of something like green fluorescent protein, or there are red fluorescent proteins, or whatever, yeah, GFP, uh, that won a Nobel Prize a few years ago. Um, and so then I don't even need to bother with antibodies. Now I've modified the organism's genetic code so that my protein always gets made with green fluorescent protein attached to it. And so wherever my protein goes, it's going to carry the green fluorescent protein with it. And I can then figure out where my protein is by just looking for this. I don't have to bother with antibodies. And so that's another way to take advantage of fluorescence 
and a microscope to figure out where some protein that I'm interested in might be hanging out. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. There was... To actually alter or like, have one of the methods that are most commonly used. Um, yeah. Do they, they, to uh, modify the genes? Yeah. Um, so there are a variety. Um, this gets into levels of detail in mouse genetics that I'm not an expert in. Um, but uh, it involves, um, you can, um, uh, there, there are a variety of ways. The easiest one is to just add in an extra copy of the protein that add an extra copy of the gene that has this extended reading frame to it, um, so that you so that you generate a longer protein. Um, the more challenging one that is doable is to remove from the genome the, the endogenous protein and then put back in. With a lot of work, you can get back into the same spot. This fusion protein um, that involves many many steps and takes about a year and a lot of money to get it to uh, done right in the mouse. Um, and, and all of the many, many steps, um, uh, you can look up like on Jackson Laboratories, they have, they explain their methods. Um, I don't know all of the steps of their methods. Um, uh, that sort of falls into the like, uh, like genetics magic um, box in my head of like, this stuff's possible, but I don't know quite how. Um, so, um, and for us, for most, again, we're mostly interested in sort of like what's going on with this. Um, Okay, so, so um, we're, we're going to have just a little bit of time to talk about the paper, um, but I do want to actually ask people, again, take five minutes, review antibody microscopy, fluorescence microscopy with antibodies, fluorescence microscopy with fusion proteins, and then also, for both of those, think about one problem that might happen where you might get an incorrect signal. With fluorescence microscopy, with antibody fluorescence microscopy, and fusion protein fluorescence microscopy. So. so go ahead and start talking about reviewing those, and then, um, uh, and then, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And this is uh, going, yeah, yeah, going back through. That's right. Yeah, well, <laughs> double exposures. Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm changing to this because I'm going to talk about the super resolution um, yeah. microscopy techniques as well. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. The this is the thing, it's like, I mean, it's just like the amount of stuff you need to know just before you can even start talking about things that have been done in the last 10 years is like growing so fast that I can't keep up with that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so good. Well, you, you can get a lot of editing work to do. Well, those slides came out of Notion, so I can't do Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, but I also took Lonnie's class. Yeah. Okay. And it's like the storm microscope. Okay, all right, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're sh a little short on time. Um, but, um, okay, so first of all, questions about what's going on antibody fluorescence microscopy and fusion protein fluorescence microscopy. How are people doing on that? Do you still need a couple minutes to talk through that? Okay, take a couple more minutes, and then if you have gotten through that, start thinking about limitations.
So, sorry, yeah, let's take, take three more minutes.
You know what it is. Yeah. Oh my god. I spoke in a So what's the limitation of the animal? Limitation. I don't think you can find it on yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because because there's three bit three viral. I think I think carbohydrates. Somebody once tried did carbohydrates, but Easter never really stuck for that. Um, no, it's, it's a protein post translation of what we. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> that's never stuck. Okay, so we're um, so okay, so um, questions about um, I guess first of all the antibody fluorescence microscopy and how that's different from Western ones. Do people have questions about like what's similar and different about this versus the Western one, first of all? You just have to see through the Yeah. So the Western, we sort of mushed up our proteins all together, separated them by size, and all we know is what's there. Actually, one other thing that Westerns let us do, which is in the paper a little bit, is that we can see how much is there. So we're not, we don't have time to go through a lot of um, the details oh, yes. of this. Um, but um, d under different conditions, we might get darker bands, meaning more is there. So Westerns tell us what's there and how much, but nothing about where in our sample it physically is located, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of problems with Westerns, yeah. did anybody come up with ideas for like problem or sorry, uh, with, uh, with, uh, an with antibody mic fluorescent microscopy? Any ideas? Sure, yeah. I was wondering if certain antibodies can stick to multiple proteins. Yeah, that's the problem. I mean, this is kind of suggested already with Western. Like, what if the antibody is not specific? What if your secondary is not specific? That can lead to false signals. Um, what about with our fluorescence microscopy where we use these fusion proteins? Um, how, what, how can that give us problems? Yeah, sure. Ensuring that the protein that is being created with DNA. Yeah, so so what if so my protein, right, what I care about is this, I care about my protein, but sticking this giant fluorescent add-on onto it might kill the protein, it stops working. It might make it so the protein doesn't go to the place in the cell where it should be going to. Um, uh, and so and so I could get incorrect signals out of that. Um, so yeah, so those are again, I mean by using combinations of techniques, you can you can get answers. But but again, one of the ideas here as well, and throughout the whole course of the semester, is to think about the limitations of these biological experiments. Um, okay, so we have just a couple minutes left, but I do want to talk about one experiment from this paper that's interesting. So proteins are strings of amino acids. They're they're like long string of amino acids, but then it folds up into this shape. In this case, the protein that they're interested in is one that spans the membrane, and it has um, five places where it crosses the membrane and one place where it dips down in the membrane but doesn't fully go through. Um, and so this protein is involved in sensing the external environment. Actually, the protein, um, uh, if, uh, uh, who likes spicy food? So, um, uh, so this protein is a protein that exists in uh, touch sensors and, tongue, and, and, and sensors in your tongue and, and mouth and so on. It, sends, it responds to heat. It opens up when there's heat. It also opens up with a chemical called capsaicin that's present in pungent chili peppers. And you, you, um, plants do this as a way to keep animals from eating them. But people, some people, 
uh, really start liking, actually liking the burning sensation. But the reason why it feels like burn is because it's the exact same thing that is designed to sense heat happens to also be activated by, um, by uh, this chemical that some plants make. Um, and humans aren't deterred by it sometimes. Um, but what I wanted to, where is the slide? Is this it? Um, no. Um, there are a variety of different methods. This was, this was it, I think. Um, just lost track of, ah, here we go. Okay. So one of the things that we'll talk about in a little while is that as proteins get around, proteins sort of modify each other. So one protein might add a chemical modification onto another protein. And then that chemical modification might change the function of the second protein, or it might instruct the protein to go to a new spot in the cell. In this case, what they did was they had some ideas about particular locations where um, a chemical modification might either cause the protein to get inserted into the membrane on the, side, on the outside of the cell or bring it in away from the membrane. Um, and so what they did is they is um, in, um, in uh, cultured cells, in just like cells that have been growing for decades, they got, they got some, some cells, some mammalian cells that, that just grow on their own or you know, keep them healthy and they grow for as long as you want, and then they inserted into that a, gene, a, 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 a DNA that codes for, in this case, WT, or in almost all, in all, in every time you see WT means wild type, the normal protein. So we've got a gene for the normal protein, or a gene where this T144 means that the 144th amino acid in the protein is a 3 amine. We'll talk a little bit about what that means next class and, for, and, uh, and continually throughout the semester. But if you go from the start of the protein to the 144th one, you find a 3 amine amino acid. They mutated that to an alanine, an A. So that T144A means that the 144th amino acid used to be a T in this, uh, in this set of cells, they made it into an A. Um, and then they went into another set of cells and had, again, the same protein where now that 144th amino acid normally is a 3 amine got mutated into an aspartic acid, which gets the abbreviation D. Um, and so what they observed, and if you read through the paper, you can see this a little bit more, but what they observed is that um, the, um, when you, the wild type protein gets to the cell surface just fine, so we're looking at either the total everywhere or just on the surface. The normal protein gets to the surface just fine. If you change this 3 amine to an alanine, basically none of it gets to the surface. And if you change it to an aspartate, some of it gets to the surface. Um, the why some of it gets to a surface is a little bit longer story than the one minute that I have left um, uh, of, of your time. Um, but um, the point being, that they can identify one particular amino acid out of the 500 or so that make up this protein that gets chemically modified, um, and that chemical modification is what controls whether the protein is hiding away inside the cell doing nothing, or out on the surface waiting for you to eat chili peppers and sense heat, or waiting for you to step out into a warm room and sense the heat thing. Um, or put your hand on the stove and sense heat or whatever. Um, and so that one amino acid modification is what dictates that. And so by using just Western blocks, where they just take Western blocks, where they either take just the proteins from the cell surface and grind them up, or take from the whole cell surface plus insides and grind that up, um, and run it out on a gel, look for the protein, they can tell you what the effect of mutating that one amino acid is on, the, on where that protein gets. Um, and so that's sort of, 
a, a simple um, a simple way to um, or, or, or sort of a, a relatively s s uh, simple example of how Western blots in this case can be used to answer questions about how a protein functions, how a protein's function is regulated, for example. Okay, what questions do people have about that?